Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. During the month of February, the Holocaust Center will be raising support for our new Book by Book Small Grants program. We know that teachers often don't have the resources they need to teach about the Holocaust. The Book by Book program provides small grants up to $500 to Washington State public school teachers who need to purchase books for their students' use. Thanks to the generous support of Kate Boris Brown and Greg Brown, I'm excited to announce that all donations made to the Book by Book program up to $5,000 this month will be matched dollar for dollar. Just launched in January, we have already received numerous requests from teachers, and we have just sent out our first round of grants. One of them went to Elaine, an instructor at Interagency, the school for students in detention in King County. She requested funds to purchase 25 copies of the graphic novel, Mouse. Elaine explained, the students I teach are from King County wide schools awaiting charges. I have been teaching there for six summers and this spring I will be teaching history and art. Using graphic novels to teach history is amazing and students are receptive to this model. Another grant application came from a high school librarian in Washougal, Washington. She requested the funds in order to create book kits that can be used in the classroom. She writes, with access to these titles, my students would get various perspectives on the Holocaust. These book kits would open up opportunities to enlighten our students generate those important discussions and make sure the history is known and not repeated. How can you help? Thanks to the generous support of Kate and Greg. If you donate today, your gift can go twice as far. A gift of any amount, big or small, will be impactful and will be matched. Attendees at our Lunch and Learn program last week donated over $500. Thank you to all of you who have already given, and if you haven't yet donated, Now's your chance to help us meet that goal again. To donate, you can check out the link in our chat or go to our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. While on a trip to Poland, I walked through the streets of cities and small towns, neighborhoods and districts that were once thriving Jewish communities. But today there are more memorials than there are Jews these communities having been wiped out during the Holocaust. My grandparents and great-grandparents grew up there. As a Jewish person, I'm struck each time by the sense of place and the sense of absence. When I return to the United States, I'm ever more cognizant that the land I walk on was taken, that here too, a genocide occurred. In 1830, just over a hundred years before Hitler and the Nazis took power in Germany, the United States passed the Indian Removal Act. This displacement forcibly removed native peoples from their ancestral homelands and resettled them on harsh desert-like reservations. In the late 19th century, the US government separated more than 30,000 native children from their families and forced them into abusive boarding schools, coercing them to assimilate to European American culture. This cultural genocide denied children their traditional customs, religion, clothing, and language. The philosophy of these schools was, quote, kill the Indian and save the man. The schools destroyed families and were plagued with malnutrition, unsanitary conditions, beatings, and even death. These schools were supported by the US government and persisted into the 1970s. Despite these practices, Native Americans retain a powerful sense of cultural identity, pride, and a resilient legacy of survival as they still struggle for political and social respect and representation. We remember and recognize that Seattle sits on the land of the Duwamish Nation. They are the indigenous people of metropolitan Seattle, having lived here as long as 115,000 years. Our beautiful city Seattle is named for the Duwamish and Suquamish Chief Seattle. Individuals of sovereign nations in the Seattle region include the Lummi, Cowlitz, Puyallup, Salish, Tulalip, and many more. It's my honor to have with us today, Daryl Hilaire, a member of the Lummi Nation and great grandson of Frank Hilaire, who in 1920 formed 
the Children of the Setting Sun Song and Dance Group. Prior to his passing, Frank Hilaire instructed his grandchildren and future descendants to quote, keep my fires burning. Daryl has used this as his compass and motivation from serving as chairperson and treasurer of the Lummi Indian Business Council to providing a home for Lummi children by building and running the Lummi Youth Academy. And more recently, serving as executive director and co-founder of Children of the Setting Sun Productions. I would encourage you to visit their website and check out their podcast series being created by youth entitled Young and Indigenous. Thank you to our partners on this week's program, Eighth Generation, a native owned business in Pike Place Market, the Duwamish Tribe, the National Urban Indian Family Coalition and the Potlatch Fund. Daryl will take questions at the end of the program. Please type in your questions at any time in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And Daryl, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Now, Siam, Nostalgia Siam. First off, I'd like to uh, I'd like to raise my hands up to Ilana and Richard for having me on, on this program. And, and those leaders at the Holocaust Center for Humanity, I'd like to raise my hands up to you. And uh, in, in our way, in our way here at Lummi and throughout Coast Salish territory, the practice of raising your hands is a way of showing respect. It's a way of uh, showing gratitude. It's a way of sharing your heart. And um, when, don't be afraid when you go to, into Indian country to, to practice this, to find out that when you do this, that you're connecting with other people that you may not know but they know what that symbolism represents. So um, that's a little teaching for today. And uh, I'd like to start a little bit uh, with a little uh, side note, if you will, um, for, for the people at the Holocaust Center for Humanity, uh, I'm gonna share a story with you. Um, some years ago, uh, we put together a stage production, uh, comedy, if you will, with, uh, with serious messages within the comedy about uh, racism. And, and the stage production was called uh, Sunny Six Killer by the Washington Redskins. And we, uh, we used our humor to, uh, to make fun of that, um, that idea that maybe, uh, maybe tribes could get together and pool their money and by the Reds, Washington Redskins football team and changed that name. And throughout the play, we raised a lot of different issues. We had a lot of laughter. And at the end of the play, we were unable to uh, change the name of the team. We did buy the team, by the way, but we didn't get to change the name of the team. That was one of the conditions that the uh, name would remain the same. So what did we do? We changed the name of the players. And so Six Killer, of course, uh, kept his name, but other people on the team, like, uh, you know, the center was uh, Half Moon, you know, and the split end was As the Crow Flies. But our water boy was a, was a white man and uh, we named him Snowflake. And we thought that was pretty funny but one day, uh, one of the cast members came to uh, rehearsal and shared with us that uh, snowflake is, is a derogatory term towards uh, Jewish people. And so we, we looked at that and we looked at what that meant in terms of what the Nazi soldiers would uh, say to those, uh, those uh, Jewish um, people standing in line to go into the, uh, incinerator and the soldier would point that out to him that hey look at that snowflake and so we left that in there but we changed the script to recognize that we're never going to um we're never going to put anybody down we changed the name of snowflake in the play to something that was more respectable and so in that light we we learned a lot about uh the holocaust through that very conversation and um, your, the people that uh, still suffer from, you know, that today, we, we empathize with you. 
because we carry uh, the same kind of trauma. So I just wanted to bring that up in preparation for what we're gonna talk about today. And also, if you got your pen and paper out, I have a few assignments for you too. If you could, uh, uh, and most of this can be found on YouTube, but if you wanna take down the name of Steve and Gwen Point from the Stalo Nation in Canada, and they were involved with the Truth and Reconciliation Panel in British Columbia during that whole period uh, when the Canadian government tried to make amends for the boarding school experience in Canada. And um, Steve and Gwen were part of the panel in BC and have a lot of uh, great uh, insights and opinions on how that whole process worked and, and also the work that uh, is yet to be done. So also, and this might be a little bit hard for you to find, if so, give me an email and I'll, one, myself or one of the staff will help you with this, but look for uh, SIAM, S-I-A-M, uh, The Life and Times of Gene Harry, Eugene Harry. And it chronicles his experience, his life experience of growing up in the language and being ridiculed for that, being sent to a boarding school and uh, them at the boarding school trying to, uh, you know, beat that language out of them. But he tells that whole story. That'd be a good place for you to learn a little bit about uh, this journey. And then for healing, I think if you look for Coast Salish teacher, teachings and look for Sammy Sam, uh, my dear elder, my uncle from um, Saanich, who shares with the world uh, what those teachings are today and how they are to be practiced. So Sammy, Sam. Uh, and uh, the uh, next to our books, I suggest reading uh, The Real All-Americans by Sally Jenkins. Uh, it's a sports book about Carlisle uh, boarding school and football, but uh, the context uh, of kids being removed from their families and being on trains and children crying in the middle of the night for uh, loss of family and loss of a, of a life way is really, it's really heartfelt. And I, I think she got close to expressing what those feelings are of like my parents and my grandparents who had to leave Lummi and go away to boarding school. And then the fifth one I, I would suggest is uh, Sand Talk by Tyson uh, Hunkaporta. And he writes about the, uh, the way that we think and act as indigenous people. And he gets really close to what is really hard for us to explain sometimes on, on how, we, uh, how we live our lives, you know? And uh, I think it's really helpful for uh, people to read that book. And, God, I'd love to talk to anybody about any of these uh, suggestions uh, after our talk today. But at this time, I'd like uh, uh, Richard, if he could uh, go to the video, I'd like to open with a video that we made for Martin Luther King Day and share that with the folks uh, to begin our time together today. Siam Nostalgia. Now Siam Nostalgia Siam. I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Martin Luther King Day celebration. On behalf of Children of the Setting Sun, I'd like to acknowledge this time together as a time of unity, a time where we need to stand together and begin to walk together towards a more uh, just and equal world. The video we are sharing with you today is from Paddle to Lummi 2019. And there are other gatherings that are included uh, that we were so honored uh, to witness over the past few years. So, Siam Nostalgia, Aishka.
Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, I just want you to know that our intentions are, are good today, that we, uh, we wanted to get together and share a little bit about who we are as a people, um, our way of life, our, our shalangan, if you will, uh, and uh, how that life way is built on uh, a culture of, of gratitude, uh, a belief in sharing, and um, and all of that comes from a, a, a deep connection to, to Mother Earth. And uh, we can try to walk towards that today. And uh, we know that that's hard to do with uh, today's uh, situation with COVID. But as uh, we're going to do the best we can. We're going to do the best with what energy we have uh, via this, uh, this tool that we call Zoom. Uh, Typically, we feed off each other's energy when we're in the room together, and we speak to what that, what that energy is, what, what we carry in, in here. But um, someday we'll do that. We'll make that commitment to, to get together, to share, and to uh, look at uh, what's going on in the world together. And uh, we're very aware of uh, the trouble that we're in uh, with each other as, as, as human beings, you know. You know, the Black Lives Matter, you know, the rising Nazism, the uh, growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country. Uh, and, um, and we also know that there's 400 million guns in this country. And so we realize this and we have work together. And we know this work requires all of us, all peoples to get together to know what's going on and how we're going to um, Work, this, work our way out of uh, these situations. Uh, but I think most important is, uh, is taking care of Mother Earth and uh, the signals that she's sending to us with this virus and, and with, with the fires uh, that are, are just ravaging ac across the Southwest. Uh, and there's just this extin extinction of the natural world that's going on. And it's real alarming to us as native people for us, it's, uh, it's salmon, you know, and it's the belief of our people that salmon are our relatives and our most sacred ancestor. And so here at Children of the Setting Sun, we've been, we've been creating the stories around our salmon to figure out how we can contribute to that uh, effort to, to bring back to life uh, something that is so central to our life and that salmon. So, Today, we want to visit our history, uh, uh, share our history, the Salish history. And uh, yes, I, I've, read, I've read books much like you have, but most importantly, um, I, I, I listen to my parents and my grandparents and uh, my elders and what's been handed down from uh, our ancestors. Because as we know, you know, when you listen to the experts and listen to the uh, legal experts, that's typically uh, viewed as, uh, as fact. And, um, and uh, it's history. But you know, we have a truth and we have a memory. And um, I remember uh, reading a uh, Harvard Divinity Bulletin one time, an article written by uh, Emily Towns. And it, I, she had a quote in there and she says, both history and memory are subjective, you know, and I, I feed off of that because uh, the history that's passed down through my family might be a little bit different from yours. And what you've been uh, reading in the books could be very well different from the history that I know of my people. So we need to treat it as being subjective and we tell we can get together and work through these things. But there are some perceptions that uh, I need to bring up today that, uh, I know it's true for our people and uh, you know, I need to say it, you know. Number one is that um, we were not conquered people. We were not conquered by the settlers here. We were murdered, we were killed, mostly with disease. And my mother pointed out to me, some of that was intentional. And uh, growing up, there were, there were 600 people living on the Lummi Reservation in 1960. 
but then you go back to the accounts of like Fort Langley and uh, and some of those legal experts, there was upwards of uh, 30,000 tribal members living in this area. And so disease uh, was a big part of that. And like Ilana was saying, there was, there was that, the, the, the annihilation of our people, but then what was left of us, uh, they decided to uh, try to uh, assimilate us. And as, as she pointed out to kill the Indian and save the man, there was an actual quote from a fellow by the name of Captain Pratt, who later became General Pratt, who ran the Carlisle, Carlisle Indian Boarding School. And, and that was the whole mission was to take away our language and take away our culture. And uh, the boarding schools were um, very cruel to our people. So you had that, you had disease, you had boarding school, and then, uh, and then alcohol. And um, you have all these really terrible things happening to our people through time from contact to, to today. And at the same time, taking away our, our spirituality and our connection to uh, our homeland. But we were not a conquered people. We went to Point Elliott in 1855, uh, a place down there in Muckleteal, Washington, and we signed a peace treaty. And uh, that peace treaty uh, indicated that we were gonna give up our homeland and move to the reservation. And when you think about that, when we moved from the San Juan Islands, we moved from different places along um, the coastline here. Um, that was really when our health disparities um, were born. When you think about taking us off the water and taking us off uh, our way of life and then uh, serve government rations while on the reservation, sugar, flour, oil, salt, alcohol, and, um, you know, that's where we became the, the Indian problem under federal Indian policy. But through all of that, uh, we never gave up. There, there was something inside of us that hungered for our way of life, that hungered for spirit and where that spirit come from but during and that helped us during our fight because once on the reservation and once uh we had the treaty and then uh becoming the indian problem because federal indian policy was always a reflection of uh, what was going on in this country and the uh, one constant denominator of greed that existed then, that still exists today, that uh, caused our government to break treaties with us, to continue to take natural resources off the land, to prohibit fishing, to, to uh, killing rivers. Uh, they always seen the tribal people as being in the way, as being the Indian problem. But as we fought back and we lived through the, 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 swing, the pendulum swinging back and forth through federal Indian policy, in, uh, like in the 30s, we had the Indian Reorganization Act and they, what they wanted us to do, they directed us to set up governments uh, just like the US government. And so a lot of tribes did that. And that was just another form of assimilation to try to become like uh, the oppressor. And, um, and then in the 50s, there was the Termination Act, where it was, it was actually a policy and, and many uh, tribes were actually terminated. And uh, my father pointed that out to me, but when they got to Lummi, uh, uh, Lummi told him to go to hell. And uh, we continued to fight. So we came through the termination era and began to, to understand how to fight the good fight and hold up the US Constitution, which says in Article 6, 
treaties are the supreme law of the land. And pointing that out to the people in Congress, pointing it out to the administration for the president, standing up to governors and mayors and county executives that no, we're not under your jurisdiction. Our relationship is with the federal government. And through that then federal Indian policy began to change. There was this Indian Self-Determination Act of, in the 1960s. And then using that to fight against the movement towards states' rights and the delegation of rights from the federal government to the state government. But we continue to fight on and then during the 80s and 90s when it's actually our chairman was part of a group of, of young leaders back then who told the federal government that we can do better than you in terms of administering and managing resources on Indian reservations. And through that was born the self-governance movement. And self-governance the self-governance movement became a defining moment in Indian country because at that point, um, we were no longer like the, under the, the parental guardianship of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We removed ourselves from that bureaucracy to where uh, at that moment when we transferred all of the resources and all of the authority uh, from the BIA and had a direct relationship with Congress, um, our funding uh, was one thing where for every $10 that was allocated to Indian country, $1 actually got to Indian country and the rest of it went to the BIA. Overnight, it was $7 for every $10. But most importantly, we could decide how we were gonna govern ourselves, how we were gonna build infrastructure, how we we're gonna provide safety. And then most importantly, how we were gonna heal. And we can, and now the, uh, the government funded programs were now tribally funded programs and we could begin integrating our own life way, our own way of life and to what we did as a government. So that was really a, a defining moment. And that was a defining moment that uh, we're still realizing the benefits of today. And then uh, at the same time, um, because of our, our diligent effort to uh, educate Congress on what treaties are and the power of treaties, uh, we, we won a, a historic court case in the 70s called the Bull Decision, where, be, where the states not recognizing the power of the treaty and our rights under the treaty tried to regulate us off the water. And when we won, we were actually, uh, we were allocated under law 50% of the harvestable catch in these waters within the Puget Sound. To some of the old people, it felt like we lost, but uh, at that time then, uh, during the 80s, and uh, we, it was really uh, a, a great coming home. A lot of people came home from the inner cities to, to establish themselves as families and to go fishing again. And uh, overnight, our, our tribal enrollment went from um, numbered in the hundreds to the thousands. So, so we have this emerging government, we have this, uh, the, this, the right to go fishing, which uh, brought a lot of people home. And then um, because of self-governance, we were to um, able to educate our people. And today we have a, a college on the Lummi reservation that when it started was really just a biology class but today it offers a number of four year degrees. And so having an educated workforce is really important so we can be at the table, uh, uh, you know, whether it be uh, negotiating federally in policy, whether it be to influence how we're gonna educate our people um, and uh, how we're gonna do economic development. So because of self-governance, we were able to afford that. And, um, you know, the, uh, Probably the most important uh, gift of self-governance and this emergence of that and, and winning uh, not only the Bolt decision, but other really important uh, court cases versus the United States government. It was actually when we were, uh, we were able to say that we want to heal. And um, it was actually my uncle, uh, James Smitty Hilaire, who brought that up some 30 years ago. He said, now we're on this healing journey. 
And I really didn't understand that at that time, but today I do, you know, from the, uh, just the um, terrible experiences that were shared when we started to talk about what happened and those things that were never talked about that were not taught in the school system. And they're not taught in the school system today either, you know, by us, by the people that experienced it. But, uh, but today, here we are, um, we're on this healing journey together. And so, so you look at that, what's, what's happened with uh, self-governance, when you look at what's happened with uh, federal Indian policy that's changed, court cases that supported what we, what we uh, are rightfully ours, and, um, and, that's, and then us deciding to, to begin healing, you, you have to think about, well, where does, that, uh, where does that strength come from? And I have to say that that really does come from um, what I think is uh, being brought out uh, uh, more and more, especially in the generation right behind me and the generation that's right behind them is that there's this emergent spirit that lives in our people that is uh, allowed to be expressed openly today. And first off, I would say it, it, it's coming to life in our language. In our language, uh, when growing up, it was very few people that uh, was able to speak our language. And today, uh, Today, there's a, many young people, and I'll have to get that inventory uh, from somebody to really share that with everybody that our language is coming back. And there, there are certain feelings that, um, that can't be expressed other than through our language. And, and we know that as a people. And when we hear, hear certain words, that brings a lot of things to life inside of us because now we're connected with the old people and we gather that strength from the old people to move forward in the work that we are doing to put ourselves back together, to understand what had happened, to continue to build our community uh, into that ideal uh, place of gratitude and generosity. So uh, it's also, uh, there are a few other phenomena, and if you see these pictures, that's from Canoe Journey, and it's no more evident the spirit of our people is coming to life because when you go to these gatherings, you see all these young people, and they're, and they're singing, and they're putting on um, their uh, cedar hats, and their paddle shirts, and their dressing much like the old people used to dress uh, hundreds of years ago in celebration of our life way and giving what they have to the people, sharing their gifts, if you will. And um, I welcome you to, to come to these journeys at some point and see what's going on there and hear the language and hear the songs and those things that give us strength as a people to move forward because there's still much work to do. And we wanna take our work and contribute to the work much like the center here is doing to uh, ensure that there's unity against hatred, there's unity mm -hmm. against racism, there's unity against ignorance, you know? And for us at the uh, Children of the Setting Sun, we're gonna continue to, to tell these stories that are emerging about our people. You know, the, the things that we're doing to uh, shed light on what we need to do for the environment, what we need to do to respect Mother Earth, what we need to do to um, have a better life for our children and our grandchildren. An example is, is that we're, we're gathering um, the salmon people in, in a couple of weeks. And the salmon people are people that have declared from their homeland, from the river, that we are the salmon people. And I'm speaking about the uh, Yurok tribe on the Klamath River. I'm talking about the Nez Perce uh, tribe on the Snake River, the Yakima tribe on the Columbia River, Lummi here at the Nooksack River and Fraser River, and the Shushrub tribe at the headwaters of the Fraser and Adams River. They all believe this, that they're the salmon people. They have this sacred responsibility to salmon, to protect the salmon, and to have clean rivers. 
So we're bringing these people together to have a show of unity, to give each other strength in the work that we do, to remove dams from the Columbia River, the Snake River, the Klamath River, fish pens from the migratory path of the sockeye salmon, return into the Fraser and Adams River. All these things need uh, uh, to be informed by our history and our culture, needs to be strengthened in the uh, joining of hands in unity and is used to really transform our, our way of life in this entire country. And it's a transformation away from greed and selfishness into uh, gratitude and generosity. And that we can no longer be indifferent to what's going on in our world, that we need to stay involved. We need to get involved. We need to take a stand, whoever that might be for each other as a people. So, um, I say that with the work that we're doing here, and I encourage us to continue to have these kinds of dialogues so we can, we can join up, if you will, and uh, get, um, get these messages out to the broader the community that have no idea what we're up against here uh, with the environment, with the spreading hatred, with the growing inequality between the rich and poor. So, that's my invitation uh, that we continue to do this and that we continue to uh, um, bring other people in and, and, and grow this circle around the work that's yes to be done. And um, I also like to share with you some other things that we're doing here at the Children of the Setting Sun that's just coming right after we have the seven people gathering. We're, we're also releasing a book with the University of Washington Press and it's called Jacental. And it was a word uh, given to us by our, our respected elder, uh, Tom Sampson from the Sarlup Nation in uh, Saanich on Vancouver Island. And he said that word means to learn and grow together. We need to learn and grow together. And, and that's why he wanted the book to be named uh, with uh, Jacental. Because when you're able to do that, then you're able to create harmony. And I think uh, we can do that. We can create harmony in this work that we, we must do together uh, today and, and in the future. It's our responsibility and I hope we can do that. So um, thank you. And I, um, I'd like to maybe turn it over to Alana and see if we can you know, dig a little deeper, if you will, in some of the things that were brought up and uh, to maybe have a conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl, for this outstanding and heartfelt presentation. We have a number of questions and I wanna start with one that came from Kate and she asks, in the last four to five years, we have seen an increase in hate crimes against many different groups. Has the indigenous community been targeted as well? And how have you responded to this? Thank you. It's never left, but you know, if, if it's been sensationalized, you know, I think um, I don't think it's 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 that way for us. You know, we're you know there have been there have been car caravans that came through Lummi and through Talela uh, without any real serious incident, but I think they just came through with their red banners just to put us on notice. You know. But it's, it's definitely palpable when we, we watch things on TV and we, we see what's being said to which minority or which peoples. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that really does cause us to be uh, not only fearful, but also wanting to prepare for what might happen, you know. And um, really, it, it's happened in their. Ferndale School District, you know, there's incidents of uh, young folks being targeted, you know, and, um, you know, it, it's just right there. It's just right below the surface. You could feel it. So another question comes from Martin and he asks, what are the, ma what are the major challenges to native peoples in terms of the younger generations accepting and building upon the culture of the older generations? And as they age, do most of the younger generations remain on the same tribal lands on which they were born? 
Well, um, I think uh, why, why the Lummi is fighting so hard for the environment, you know, we won the, uh, the construct, we won, we defeated the uh, proposed construction of a coal port at Cherry Point. We, uh, we were the first responders at the salmon, uh, the, the uh, fish farm spill uh, a couple of years ago. And we go stand with the Yakima and Nespers and all those other tribes because what's happening is if our, if our people are unable to go fishing, then those stories don't get told. And the language is lost, and uh, the life way of you know having salmon on our table, every gathering that part is is threatened. You know, so that I think that's the biggest threat is is salmon. We kind of view salmon as the minor canary of uh, the Puget Sound, the, the Salish Sea, if you will. So go the salmon. So go so many other things. You know, but for us, it's uh, it's very uh, central to who we are as a people. So Daryl, another question, this one comes from Allison and, um, and a couple of people have asked this question. Can you, can you help with the preferred terminology for Native Americans? Is it, would you prefer Native American, Indigenous? What, what terminology is, um, do you use and would you recommend others use? Well, uh, you know, the, um, the Lummi people are actually the Lactamish people. And, you know, uh, you need to take the time when you ask somebody about what their, what their affiliation is, is to be uh, not kind of going right to, you know, the generic terms, you know, but maybe politely asking how they, how they want to identify. And um, it's, it's really easy to do. You just got to take the time and think about that, you know, to see every person identifies differently, you know. But for me, that's so I like to identify with my family and then my people. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, another question um, that came from Marcy. And she asks, can you, she says, first, Daryl, this is so inspiring. Can you comment on House Bill 1356 currently being discussed in our state legislature that proposes the banning of the use of native symbols, names, or images as public school mascots, logos, or team names? Yeah, uh, Deborah Lakanov, she's a good friend um, and she's putting that bill forward and you know, the mascot thing is just an ignorant issue, you know, um, making fun of a people that you've murdered, making fun of the people that you've, uh, you, you've killed in, inside, you know, it's just not, it's not very humane, you know, and I'm glad that they're trying to do that. I know the, one of the news, uh, uh, newscasts pointed out, well, even a majority of the Native Americans polled, you know, support mascots, you know, Native mascots. And that just points out to the level of ignorance that uh, even our own people who identify as Native uh, have, you know, because if they knew the history, if they knew uh, where the, all those terminologies come from, and if they were taught in the school, they, I don't think they would, feel, I don't think anybody would feel that way, you know. But that's mm -hmm. the big flaw is our school systems don't teach the, the genocide of this in the, that took place in this country, much like they need to teach uh, uh, about the uh, slavery in this country, you know? There's two major, major uh, uh, things that need to be picked up in our school system from kindergarten through you know, higher education. These things need to be taught. That's, those things are foundational. That's what we're built on, you know? These, mm -hmm these atrocities, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you talked about a healing journey and I'm interested to know where you would like to see this go and what does a healed nation look like to you? 
Well, for me, it's it's breaking that cycle of abuse within our own families. You know, it's a very it's a very personal thing, and uh, uh, government's not going to save uh, people or heal people. I mean, look at the billions of dollars that the federal government puts in to fight opioids, right? And I, 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 it's not, not a matter of pride, but it's a matter of uh, courage, I think, when you go to Lummi or you go to Swinomish or Tulalip or the tribes around here, and they're openly talking about the epidemic and they're walking right towards it. And they're looking at things holistically, which means they don't leave uh, the spirit and spirituality out of their practice. They integrate the, the, the work of the elders and the spiritual people and the medical people and the mental health people. They work together, try to work our way out of this, you know. So I think that's something that we need to be really um, proud of and we need to hold up is this is this is the way, you know, and we're trying to keep families together, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I have another question here. This one is coming from uh, one of our attendees on Facebook who writes, is it possible to use the names and symbols respectfully? There are a couple of schools named Tai and they use the totem pole as a school symbol. Is that also not acceptable? Especially if it's understood by the school community, the meaning of the history and the name. You know, I all of those things need to be taken uh, individually and talking to the people from that area, you know. I have to applaud uh, people like, um, you know, we're working with the Peace Health Organization, you know, they run a lot of hospitals in the area and they want to do a land acknowledgement, you know, which is kind of a thing today, you know, a land acknowledgement, but they don't want to do it just kind of like a sitting down with Daryl and we'll write some good words down on paper and put it on the board. No, they want to visit all of the tribal people and they want to understand you know, uh, historical trauma. They want to understand displacement. They want to understand where all the um, maybe perhaps healthcare disparities come from so that the words that they put to paper have meaning, you know, that they're not words that are just kind of, you know, the word of the day kind of thing. So I encourage that kind of engagement with whoever's, uh, you know, doing that kind of work, whether it's, you know, a name of a school or a totem pole in their school or land acknowledgements or, you know, any type of uh, you know, public declaration that, uh, you know, is going to be looked at by people as, you know, being the truth, you know, it comes back to that, you know, that how do we get truth out there, you know. <clears throat> so Daryl, you mentioned land acknowledgements and I'm interested to hear more about that from you. I know it's becoming more and more commonplace in presentations and elsewhere for people to be making them and I'm wondering your your thoughts on on them and um, yes we should do it genuinely but how is it received and and you know what what uh, what are your feelings on it well uh, you know it's, it's a land acknowledge means you're acknowledging the people you know and do you really know the people you're acknowledging you know uh, so it's like it's not really uh, saying that, you know, when you say land acknowledge, we are thinking about, well, all the real estate outside. And I'm thinking about, do they really know how much hurt my people carry from some of the things that happen in, in our neighborhood, our community here, this place where we, what we call home, you know, do they know that history? You know, is that why they're saying this? Or are they just kind of trying to say it because it's kind of the thing to do, you know? So it's a question, you know? It's a question I have uh, each time that I, I hear one, you know, I hear them quite often, you know. <clears throat> so it sounds like it's a, it's a question of intent, not, not just the doing it. And it sounds like it's also, I like the way you describe it. It's about the people, not about the land. Right, right. Mm -hmm. They go together, you know, we're inseparable, you know, so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we have time for just one more question. And this one comes from Natalie and she asks, I know this is a really sensitive subject, but can you also comment on the bill that is moving forward for teaching Native American history in Washington schools, but only on federally recognized tribes?
That's the time immemorial bill. Is that what she's talking about? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm for it. We're, we're in the door, right? <laughs> we're, we're not an afterthought, you know, and we're at the table. We have educated people. We have, uh, we have the spirit of our ancestors with us. We have an opportunity to create, share, and educate uh, each other. That's a, that's a good thing. You know, and then we have work to do. We all have work to do and it's getting people pointed in the same direction. And, you know, the bottom line for us is taking care of mother earth because if we don't, she's gonna take care of us. And I don't think it's gonna be that pretty if we don't acknowledge that, you know? So it's, uh, it's the most important work of our generation, I think. So hopefully we can get these things set up. So that's, that becomes all of our interest, you know, and all of our, our passion. Daryl, I said that was the last question, but I actually want to ask you one more, if that's okay. Sure. I, I'd love to hear from you what message you would like us all to take away and pass on after today's presentation. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I follow some people, and one of them is Oren Lyons, who promotes... Uh, it promotes unity. So promote unity, promote equity, and promote peace. And let's make that our, our uh, mission together, you know, this, uh, this tree of peace that he talks about. I, I believe that that's what we need to, to um, change things that are happening to us as a people in this world. <clears throat> That's so important. Thank you. That's a powerful, that's a powerful message. Yeah. Daryl, it's been such an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for sharing your personal opinions and your stories and your history and your family. Thank you for sharing all of it with us today. Aishka, thank you. Thank you so much. I know many people asked about the resources that Daryl mentioned at the beginning of the program, and we will write them up in a list that will be emailed to everyone after the program, so they will all be available. There was a, um, lots of really great books and videos mentioned, and we'll make sure to compile those. This program was recorded, so if you would like to go back and watch it later or share it with others, you'll find it on our website starting tomorrow along with all of our other past Lunch and Learn programs. Thank you to Michelle Quinones for providing closed captioning for us today. And I wanna give a very special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who is running the technical side of this show and who was the driving force behind this two-part series last week and this week. Also a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon, and our entire team, Nicole Bella, Lori Warshall cohen Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, Sydney Dreitel, Ellie Seleski, Amanda Davis, Rick Brewer, Katie Lawrence, and Morgan Romero. Please join us next week to hear from local Holocaust survivor, Josh Gortler, who will share his story and discuss his new book called Among the Remnants. When three-year-old Josh Gortler and his family were forced from their hometown in Poland during World War II, they scrambled for safety border over border, finding refuge at last in Europe's displaced persons camps. Undocumented and unschooled, Josh spent his adolescence learning to survive, and his family eventually relocated to the United States. He found himself starting over with only his wits to rely on. Some of you who uh, have been in Seattle for a while might know of him. He is an institution in the Seattle area. We hope you can join us for this powerful story next week, Tuesday at noon. Thank you again to Daryl and thank you to everybody for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. And this concludes our program.